Tonight, uh, our guest speaker, uh, Professor Lawrence Lessig. <clears throat> Professor Lessig is the director of the Edmund Safra Foundation Center for Ethics and also a member of the faculty of the, of the Harvard Law School, both of them at Harvard. Before coming to Harvard, he was on the faculty of the Stanford Law Center and um, was the founder of the Stanford Center for Internet and Society. He focused a good deal for a number of years on the issues of uh, technology and law and ethics, including uh, copyright law and issues having to do with copyright on things that are over the Internet. Um, he has written uh, widely on, that, on those issues. In, the, in most recent years, he's been working on issues having to do with corruption of institutions, um, including our political institutions, which he will be, I think he will probably be addressing tonight. <laughs> you will be interested to know that uh, 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 Professor Lessig uh, graduated with a BA in economics and a Bachelor of Science in Management from Pennsylvania. He, uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, he did, a, uh, he did a did a law degree at Yale, and he clerked for Richard Posner at uh, was the Seventh Century, Seventh uh, Circuit, uh, Seventh Century. Sorry, <laughs> it's a Jungian slip, um, and um, and also for uh, Judge Antonin Scalia of the Supreme Court. He may tell you about that in a minute. Um, he, is all, he also taught on the faculty of the University of Chicago Law School. So uh, I'm just delighted to have uh, welcome you to this uh, program and to turn it over to you. Citizen United at One Year. Thank you. So I have three ideas to offer as an introduction to an argument, just one argument, which will then try to get you to do something, something I think is extremely important for the future of this democracy. So here's the introduction, here's the first idea. Root striker. So in 1846, a place called Walden Pond outside of Boston, this man Henry David Thoreau wrote this. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root, root striker. That's the first idea, here's the second. Think about this idea of independence. Most Americans, when they think of independence, think of the independence of 1776, our liberation from Britain. That's not the independence I want you to think about. I want you to think about the independence Americans were thinking about in 1786, just a few years before we drafted and enacted our Constitution, when most in America believed that America was a failure, when a certain lack of independence was spread in the democracies throughout our republic, a certain improper dependence, a dependence which was the obsession of our framers and Jane Austen, a dependence which Jefferson described would beget subservience and venality, suffocate the germ of virtue and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. This is what government had become, institutions dependent upon the wrong influences. And what they sought was a non-dependent, an independent government that might seek the right answer for the right reason. Their common aim was a set of institutions, a set of constitutions against improper dependence. But what it means to be against improper dependence means institutions with the proper dependence. So think, for example, about what we mean when we say an independent judiciary. An independent judiciary doesn't mean a judiciary that gets to do whatever the hell it wants. It's not a judiciary that gets to make up the law however it likes. What, it mean, what we mean by an independent judiciary is a judiciary dependent upon the law, not upon politics, 
not upon bribes, but upon the law. A proper dependence is what we mean by independence. That's the second idea. Here's the last. Think now about trust. And I want you to recognize the way trust is a function of independence. So think, for example, about this chemical all of you recognize as bisphenol A, which you obviously know as <laughs> BPA, a chemical that's strewn through our modern life. 80% of you have high enough concentration of BPA in your body to lead many people to believe it's having a biologic effect. That leads many to ask, is BPA safe? And of course, the naive, I count myself among them, um, of us say, of course it's safe. It must be safe. How could there be a chemical throughout our environment that the government would allow to be there if it weren't safe? <laughs> but of course, the research about BPA is fundamentally contested and contested in a very interesting way. If you distinguish between <laughs> industry-funded research and independently-funded research, and research that finds a biologic effect and research that doesn't find a biologic effect, there's a very troubling pattern here. There's a radical difference between whether there's a finding of biologic effect versus no biologic effect as a function of who's funding the research. And whatever you thought about BPA, what I can tell you right now is now you are less sure about whether BPA is safe. Or think about these devices. Are cell phones safe? These microwave emitting devices that we place within a centimeter of our brain, are they safe? And 70% of you think, of course they must be safe. We've had cell phones for more than 50 years. The government must have figured out whether these are safe or not, right? But again, research here is contested and contested in a very troubling way. If you distinguish between industry funded and independently funded research, finding a biologic effect caused by this microwave radiation, there's an overwhelming majority of independently funded research that finds such an effect, and independently funded research finds the op uh, industry funded research finds the opposite. And whatever you thought before I mentioned cell phones, now you are less sure. Now the point in both of these cases is that your confidence in the claims of an institution is affected by money and its relationship to those claims. Not money in the abstract, I mean money in the wrong place, where it leads you to believe that the money might be corrupting the recommendation, the judgment of the person making the claim. So what that means is that for these institutions to maintain confidence, for them to maintain trust, they must secure independence from these sources of influence by securing the proper dependence the institution is supposed to have for the conclusions the institution is supposed to reach. Those are the three ideas, root striker, independence, and trust. Now here's the argument. So on January 21st, 2010, a year and a day after Barack changed the way Washington works, Obama came to office, the United States Supreme Court issued a decision in the case of Citizens United versus the FEC. And just to be clear, I think this is an awful decision. It's an awful decision because what it did was equate corporations in a certain important respect with persons. The following decision in Buckley versus Vallejo, a decision which gave individual people a constitutional right, which was fundamental in Buckley versus Vallejo's conception to what the First Amendment required, Citizens United extended the very same right to corporations. And what was that right? It was the right to expend an unlimited amount in independent expenditures to promote or oppose political candidates. So long as they're independent of the campaign, corporations are allowed to spend an unlimited amount supporting or opposing political candidates. Now this decision has been characterized in ways that I think are unfair to the court. Right? What the Supreme Court did not say was that it was because in corporations are persons that corporations have this right. That's not why the corporations had that right. The reason corporations had that right was because the First Amendment 
says, Congress shall make, doesn't, it says no law, but it really means not a lot of law, abridging the freedom of speech. It was a limitation on Congress in the form of the First Amendment that happened to benefit corporations. Now the puzzle here, for those of us who watch the First Amendment and the world's reactions to decisions of the First Amendment, is that when the Supreme Court says that the First Amendment's requirement that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech happens to benefit the Nazis or the communists or the pornographers, we, especially we liberals, celebrate, hooray, the First Amendment has stood up for fundamental values that are important to our tradition. But here, when the Supreme Court said the First Amendment requires that we protect the speech of entities like Exxon, there's outrage, <laughs> terrible, that we protect the speech of a company like Exxon. And even to the such extremes, there's my favorite extreme example. This is a Supreme Court sanctioned murder of what little actual democracy is left in this democracy. It is government of the people, by the corporations, for the corporations. It is the dark ages. It is our Dred Scott. Our Dred Scott? <laughs> There's a little bit of an extremism here to this rhetoric, but what's puzzling to me about this is why it is that Americans are so fundamentally supportive of the idea of free speech in a wide range of contexts for people that we hate, Nazis. We hate. But when it comes to corporations, we are opposed to the idea of granting these rights to these corporations. What are we missing? Indeed, one of my colleagues said, this just shows how ignorant Americans are about the First Amendment. And in my view, that's not quite right. This is not showing that Americans are ignorant. It's showing the Supreme Court's obtuseness about a very important issue at stake here. Now, of course, this is the first time the Supreme Court has ever been obtuse about <laughs> an issue. I mean, the first time except for Dred Scott, where they held African Americans could never be citizens, or Bradwell, where they said a woman didn't have a right to be a lawyer with this language. Man is or should be woman's protector and defender. The natural law and pr proper timidity and delicacy which befits the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. Or Plessy versus Ferguson saying that segregation was reasonable, or Lochner saying that minimum wage laws were unconstitutional, or Korematsu saying that Japanese Americans could be placed in concentration camps consistent with the Due Process Clause, or Bowers v. Hardwick saying that we could criminalize homosexual sodomy. Except for these cases, this is the first time ever <laughs> that the Supreme Court has been obtuse about an issue. But as each of those cases demonstrate, the obtuseness of the court is passing. And what we need to do is to figure out what we can say, what it means for us to give the court a way to see what they are now missing. So that's what I want to try to do tonight. And I want to do it in three steps. And here's the first. So the decision in the court of Citizens, the decision by the court in Citizens United addressed a statute called the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2001, BICRA or the McCain-Feingold Campaign uh, uh, Reform Statute. The Supreme Court looked at that statute and said that it was in effect a restriction on speech. And they looked at the First Amendment and they said this restriction on speech is permitted only if there's a compelling state interest to justify it. And the number one compelling state interest they pointed to was the compelling state interest in avoiding corruption. The idea of money in brown paper bags in mind. It's the quid pro quo corruption that the court was thinking of when the court said to avoid corruption would be a compelling state interest and not just actual corruption. The court was also willing to entertain the idea of the appearance of corruption. So in Buckley versus Vallejo, the opinion from which this case emerges, the court wrote, of almost equal concern as the danger of actual quid pro quo arrangements is the impact of the appearance of corruption stemming from public awareness of the opportunities for abuse inherent in a regime of large individual financial 
contributions. So to avoid both actual corruption and the appearance of quid pro quo corruption, the court in Buckley allowed contributions to be limited. But because independent expenditures were separate from the campaign, the court held that those could not be limited. But actual and appearance of quid pro quo corruption was enough, the court held, to restrict free speech. But notice this about how the court thinks about this concept of corruption. What the court's talking about here is the corruption of an individual, Blagojevich. But the question here is, is that the only corruption that a government can suffer? Is it only individuals that can be corrupted? Or can institutions themselves become corrupted, justifying in the same way the kind of restrictions on speech that might be necessary to eliminate that corruption? And the answer to that, I think, is found by looking very carefully at the framers and their conception of what they were doing. And my strongest recommendation is that the work of Zephyr Teachout, who teaches here at Fordham, um, is an important clue to understanding what they thought about corruption. So the framers of our Constitution gave us what they said was a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And a representative democracy was meant here to be independent, but independent because it was properly dependent. As the Federalist 52 says, properly dependent because it was dependent upon the people alone. So here's the picture they had in mind. Like that, I do my own graphics. That's pretty cool, right? The way it bounces. And <laughs> the people, in a marionette-like way, controlling our government. That's the conception. That's their idea. That's what independence for the framers meant. But the problem, of course, is that our Congress has evolved a different dependence. A dependence not just on the people, but increasingly upon the funders. The people who fund the campaigns that Congress wages to get back into power. Members spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back into Congress or to get their party back into power. And through that practice, they develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness of how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become shape shifters, adjusting their view in light of what they understand will be necessary to raise money. This woman, Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, a senior colleague mentioned to her that she should always, quote, lean to the green. And then just to clarify, he, he went on, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> now the point to recognize is that this too is a dependency. It's a different and conflicting dependency from the dependency upon the people alone because, let's state this clearly if it's confusing to anybody, the funders are not the people. Now, I get a lot of pushback when I make this argument, so I want to be very careful. Some people think maybe the funders are the people. Maybe people give money, all people give money, and that's the way funding of campaigns happens. But in fact, what we know from surveys of who gives money is that people who make $75,000 or less, 80% of them never give any money to any political campaign. People who make $75,000 or more, they give the money to the campaign. These are wildly different groups who fund campaigns. Now, that leads some to say, well, maybe the members of Congress ignore the funders and just follow the people. Uh -huh. But in fact, we have very powerful scientific evidence to refute that very hopeful assumption. Martin Guylands did a study of attitudes of the top 10% of Americans versus the bottom 90% of Americans. So the top 10% we can say is the proxy for the funders. The bottom 90% is the rest of America. And he asked the question, what happens when the views or the attitudes of the top 10% conflict with the views or attitudes of the bottom 90%? What do congressmen do? And what he found was that outcomes strongly reflect the preferences of the most affluent, but bear virtually no relationship to the preferences of the poor or middle-income Americans. There is a vast discrepancy between what our government does and what the ideals of a government dependent upon the people alone would 
produce. So this is what I think we know. Number one, Congress is dependent upon the funders. Number two, policy follows the funders. And number three, the framers intended dependence here is therefore corrupted. That dependence upon the people is corrupted. Now, you might even look at this still and be a little bit skeptical. If you were skeptical, you, be, you could become the chairman of the F, uh, Federal Election Commission, like this man, Brad Smith. Brad Smith was the chairman of the Federal Election Commission. He and I have debated this issue now twice. He is firmly convinced that money has no effect on <laughs> results in Congress. Indeed, I was on a radio program with, on, with him in, in uh, Cleveland last month. Um, and I was so astonished, in the middle of the radio program, I had to tweet what, in fact, he said, and this is what he tweeted. Brad Smith, there's a consensus as strong as the consensus about global warming that money is not affecting results. <laughs> and then I did a hashtag, hashtag BS, that means Brad Smith. That's what that stands for. <laughs> so if you're one of these people who believes that the consensus is as strong as the consensus of global warming, that money is having no effect here, then I'm going to do a little brainwashing to pull you back into reality mode here. Here are some examples that might undermine your confidence in this wonderful story of how democracy works in America. Think, for example, about an area that I fought for many years, copyright. I became a copyright activist on October 27, 1998 when Congress passed and the President signed a statute in honor of this great American, Sonny Bono. <laughs> the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. A statute which extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. Now the question Congress was supposed to be asking as they passed this statute unanimously was whether this statute could have advanced the public good, the idea of extending the term of an existing copyright. Because, of course, a copyright is intended to create incentives. The one thing we know about incentives is that they are prospective. Not even the United States Congress can get George Gershwin to produce anything more. So it could make no sense to extend the term of an existing copyright if what you're trying to do is to produce new incentives. So clear was this that when we asked a bunch of economists, including this liberal left-wing econ oh wait, I'm sorry, this is Milton Friedman, right-wing, <laughs> Nobel Prize-winning economist, to sign a brief in the Supreme Court challenging the statute, Friedman said he would only sign the brief if the word no-brainer was in the brief somewhere. <laughs> so obvious was it that this could not possibly advance the public good to extend the term of existing copyrights. But obviously, there were no brains in this place when Congress unanimously passed this statute. What there was was more than six million dollars in contributions from the Disney Corporation and many more millions from other copyright holders who would benefit from this extension of existing copyright terms. Or here's another example, something more concerned to people on the right. The Wall Street Journal had a piece at the end of last year about these temporary tax provisions that are in our code and the puzzle about how temporary tax provisions have grown in the tax code. As they grafted in the early 1990s, there were practically none. Now there are hundreds of these temporary tax provisions. And the Wall Street Journal just couldn't figure it out. Now, temporary tax provisions get born with Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan created the first one in 1981 as the, as the uh, uh, bill enacted the Research and Development Tax Credit. And the Research and Deve Development Tax Credit was originally temporary because there was a real debate in Congress about whether it made sense. The Republicans said this tax credit would actually incentivize investment in the right place, and the Democrats said it didn't. And so the two got together and they said, let's test it. After a number of years, we'll ask the economists to tell us, did it work? And if it works, we'll make it permanent. If it doesn't work, we'll get rid of it. So they asked economists after a number of years, did it work, whether it worked, and almost unanimous, unanimously, the economists said it did. All agreed that it did, Republicans and Democrats alike, that this was a great tax credit idea. One of the very few, perhaps, but this was a great tax credit. It spurred investment and it made sense, absolutely made sense, because it spurred a kind of investment that otherwise wouldn't have been incentivized. But here's the puzzle. This temporary tax credit is still temporary. Why is it still temporary? 
Well, the answer was suggested in this piece by the Conservative Institute for Policy Innovation, their tax bite analysis, where they write about the fact that Congress essentially uses this cycle of temporary tax benefits to raise money for re-election by promising industry more predictability the next time around. Or Rebecca Kaisar made this point more extensively in a piece she wrote in the Georgia Law Review. The principal recipients of the research credit are large US manufacturing corporations. These businesses, she writes, are more than willing to invest in lobbying activities and campaign donations to ensure the continuance of this large tax savings. So the point is, each time the credit is about to expire, the lobbyists call up the corporation and say, quick, we need to get Congress to extend it another couple of years. And the corporations say, great, we'll send you millions of dollars, lobbyists. And then the lobbyists go on the hill and they say to the members of Congress, we can raise lots of money to help your campaign. And of course, you know, by the way, we need this tax credit extended. So each cycle, it produces money for the lobbyists and the campaigns of members of Congress. And if they ended it by making it permanent, it wouldn't produce the money for lobbyists and campaigns anymore. So it's this dynamic which is central to how Washington now works. We <laughs> architect tax policy to make it easier to raise campaign money and money for lobbyists. Indeed, if you think about the architecture of our current tax policy, it's filled with a whole bunch of deals given to the wealthiest members in our society because they can afford to hire the lobbyists and indirectly fund the campaigns that members of Congress need. And that's the architecture of tax policy, and not just tax policy. When Al Gore was vice president, he had an idea to reorganize the way we regulated telecommunications so that all of the telecommunications policy that would affect internet would be under its own title, Title VII, and that title would basically deregulate all of the industries that provided internet service, not even network neutrality regulations, very minimal regulations. His chief of staff took this idea to Capitol Hill and as reported to me by him, he was told by Capitol Hill, hell no, <laughs> if we deregulate these guys, how are we going to raise money from them? So the point is, we tax to raise money for campaigns. We regulate to raise money for campaigns, which should lead all of us to ask, what is this money doing to our democracy? Or here's another example. This is a picture of a 14-year-old boy. It's a picture of a certain epidemic that's sweeping America, the obesity epidemic. Since 1980, the number of obese children has tripled. Right now, one-third of children over the age of two are technically obese. Now, this epidemic, of course, has profound costs. Most interesting is the rise of type 2 diabetes, a kind of diabetes that used to afflict only old people. Today, in some areas, one half of the new cases are cases that come from kids. Total cost is estimated by the Center for American Progress to be about $147 billion in annual direct care costs leading many people properly to ask, why is it we have produced this nation of overeating children? Well, one reason is what we eat, right? So there's a consensus among people who know something about this, that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. Or more precisely, it's not technically sugar that we eat too much of, it's high fructose corn syrup. Something like 40% of the products in your supermarket, or maybe not your supermarkets, but you know, the average supermarket in America <laughs> has high fructose corn syrup in it, leading people to wonder what explains this extraordinary rise in a sweetener which 40 years ago literally no human had ever consumed. And the answer is that the cost of sugar is high relative to the cost of corn leading some pro free market types to say, well, them's what the markets demand. If the market says this is more expensive than something else, then we want the resources in the market to go to the most efficient user, and that produces the result that sugar is substituted by corn. But it's not quite so simple. Sugar in America is expensive because there are tariffs that protect the domestic sugar industry by blocking foreign imports of sugar. Tariffs that give about a billion dollars in extra profit to those industries and cost American industry generally about three billion dollars in higher costs because sugar in America costs two to three times the price 
that it costs in other nations that don't have similar tariffs. And corn is so cheap in America because it's subsidized. $74 billion over the last 15 years, leading some economists to say it's actually cost a negative amount to produce corn. So you think about putting these two factors together, and what we see is a radical shift in the cost of foods. So for example, between 1997 and 2003, the cost of vegetables went up by 17%. Cost of a Big Mac went down by 5.4%. Cost of a bottle of Coke went down by 35%. And that also produces a radical shift in how food gets made. I'm sure many of you saw this great film, Food, Inc., which describes that because corn is so cheap, it's actually profitable to feed cattle corn rather than have them graze on grass. Profitable for the farmers, not so profitable for the cattle, because of course the stomachs of cows don't actually digest corn properly. It stews in there forever, breeding all sorts of bacteria, forcing the cattle producers to feed literally tons of antibiotics to their cattle to get rid of these bugs that are stewing in their stomachs. Of course, breeding plentiful kinds of bacteria, antibiotic resistant bacteria. All this because we have corn so cheap and sugar so dear in the United States. Now, free market types should look at this and say, why is there such anti-free market silliness in our government policies? And a lot of possible reasons, but here's the one thing we know. There is an endless supply of campaign cash driving to each of these crazy results. ADM spends literally millions of dollars pushing towards policies that protect sugar. And the, as the Post reports, there are millions of dollars spent by Florida producers to support the tariffs which block competition in sugar. So if it's because of campaign contributions, we can say campaign contributions distorts the market, which distorts food production, which distorts our children. Yes. Or here's another example. Think of this place. You've heard of it around here, I hear. Well, it turns out the rest of America has heard about this place too because, of course, the financial collapse that happened here triggered a collapse of the economy around the world. Why is it we had that collapse? A lot of theories. But this one's particularly interesting, provided by Simon Johnson and James Quack in their book, 13 Bankers. As they account for it, there was a perverse mix in policy over the past 20 years, a mix of too little government and too much government. So too little government in the form of deregulation. 1990s saw an explosion in financial innovations, but because the government chose not to regulate those innovations, those new financial assets, the way they regulated financial assets since the last depression, these innovations were invisible to the market. The market didn't know how much of them there were out there or what their prices actually were or how to value them or what the liquidity for each of them would actually be. So as a colleague, Frank Partnoy, estimated for me, in 1980, he says, 98% of the financial assets in our economy were traded in public exchanges subject to the standard New Deal rules that guaranteed publicity and anti-fraud requirements for those assets. But by 2008, Partnoy estimates, 90% of the financial instruments in our economy were exempt from those regulations, traded over the counter, not subject to any publicity requirements or any anti-fraud requirements, producing a huge shadow banking market, which encouraged, Quack and um, Johnson suggest, the bubble that, of course, when it collapsed, took the economy down. But that alone was not enough, according to these authors. In addition to that, we had too much government because throughout the 1990s, the government gave a clear signal to the market, a signal in the form of a kind of guarantee that if and when the bubble burst, there would in effect be a bailout on the other end, leading people like Krugman to say this, we socialized the risk, privatized the benefit, clearly the dumbest form of socialism man has ever invented, <laughs> An insanely stupid policy, it's a technical term, insanely stupid <laughs> policy 
for financial regulation. So what led us to that policy? Well, many possible things, but here's the one thing we know. The fastest growth in campaign contributions from the period 1980 to 2008 came from the financial services sectors and the security sector exploding in their ability to leverage their campaign money into control over public policy. Or think finally about this catastrophe happening just a year ago. Many people look at this and say, how is it that we could have such an experimental drill, drilling system, very deep water drilling, without adequate environmental impact or risk studies being performed. After all, in my part of the country, we've just spent nine years and produced 10,000 pages of environmental impact studies before we were allowed to permit this clean energy project to go forward. So how much study was there before this deep water drilling project was allowed to go forward? And the answer was 17 pages before they were exempted from any further EPA requirements because no requirements were mandated by the statutes. Now this, of course, shocked Congress. Yet, of course, it was Congress that had required these insane rules by requiring approval within 30 days of the application for these drilling permits. And so why did Congress adopt such crazy rules for experimental drilling? Well, many possible reasons. One thing we know here, again, is endless campaign cash driving to these conclusions. Now, here's the point. In each of these cases, all I have to do is point to the money and your faith in the judgment collapses. And my claim is, number one, it's because of cases like these that Americans believe money buys results in Congress. Indeed, 75% of Americans from our last polling believe money buys results in Congress. A Little bit more Democrats than Republicans, but can, I can guarantee you, because I've been following this for a while, that when the Democrats controlled Congress, a little bit more than Republicans than Democrats. But the point is, regardless, most all of us believe money buys results in Congress. Leading to number two, that belief produces extraordinary erosion in trust in this institution. The latest Gallup poll finds that 11% of Americans have confidence in Congress. 11%. Let's put this in, you should put this in some context. There were more people who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in our Congress today. And that leads to number three, lower trust erodes public participation in our government. So rock the vote, extraordinary youth organization that registered and turned out more young voters than had ever been turned out in modern political history, then polled their voters just in the last election to ask why they were not just going to turn out to vote. And the number one reason given by young voters was that, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change, making it irrational for them to waste their time to go out and vote and leading many of them to choose not to vote after they had turned out in droves to elect Barack Obama. And it's not just kids who are not turning out to vote. The vast majority of Americans did not vote in the last election because of this belief. And finally, I think we can understand this as a function of the improper dependence that I've just described. We can understand this product as the product of a kind of corruption. It is corruption of the Congress our framers intended because it's not a Congress dependent upon the people alone. And it is Buckley versus Vallejo appearance of corruption because whether or not there's quid quo, quo bribery here, most people believe that the money is driving the results rather than the merits or the will of the people. And those two conclusions together should justify rules to secure independence of Congress, should justify even for the Supreme Court. Okay, so here's what I've said. If quid pro quo corruption is a reason, sufficient reason to regulate speech to protect against corruption, then independence corruption is also a reason, a sufficient reason, that should permit regulations against this independence corruption. 
So will it? Will the Supreme Court permit such regulation? Well, we can't know yet. The court's going to decide a very important case about whether public funding of elections is even constitutional this term. But what we can know, I think, is what we should be doing right now before the Supreme Court gets around to correcting the obtuseness that led to Citizens United. And that's what I want to focus on in the last couple minutes of this talk. What should we do? Now, what we should do is first understand what we should not do. And I am in a minority of those who criticize Citizens United because I am not somebody who believes that we should try to rally the troops to pass a constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United. I think that's a mistake for two different reasons. Number one, the number 67. To get amendment proposed for the states to consider requires at least 67 senators and two-thirds of the House, but 67 senators to vote in favor of that amendment. Now, whatever you think about Citizens United, However united America is in its opposition to Citizens United, there is no way to count to 67 in the current United States Senate. But number two, even if we succeeded, imagine an extraordinary revolution of people rising up and getting their senators to support the idea of overturning Citizens United, declaring corporations are not persons, corporations cannot spend unlimited amounts of money to support political candidates. Even if we could get from where we were on January 20th, 21st, 2010, to where we were on January 20th, 2010, one day before, even if we get back to the world before Citizens United, here's the thing to remember. On January 20th, 2010, our democracy was already broken. So the idea that we would rally an extraordinary movement to do what is almost impossible to get the United States Supreme Court to pass, an, uh, the United States Senate to pass an amendment to overturn Citizens United would still not be enough because it would leave a political influencing system which is exactly the system we've had for the last 30 years that produces the world where money buys results even without corporations paying for independent campaign expenditures. Instead, in my view, the thing we've got to work on right now first is to fix this dependency by making the funders the people by following the example of a number of small states, including Arizona, red state, Maine, a red and blue state, Connecticut, a blue state, to adopt a system to allow members to run voluntary small dollar elections so that they opt into a system where they take only small dollar contributions. And those small dollar contributions are magnified in some way by government spending to make sure that they need to take only those small dollar contributions. Because if we had elections where candidates took small dollar contributions only, and in Connecticut in the very first year of the program, close to 80% of members opted into this small dollar contribution system only. If we had a system where candidates took small dollar contributions only, then we could believe, as we all want to believe, that when Congress did something stupid, it was because there were either too many Republicans or too many Democrats, but the thing we would not believe is that it was because of the money. We would have removed this debilitating, cynical understanding of everything our government does, and we would have made trust in what they do possible. We wouldn't have guaranteed it. We would have made it possible because we would have restored the right kind of dependence that our government was intended to have. We would have restored its independence. Now opponents of Citizens United and supporters of an amendment say, well, is that enough? Imagine we had a small dollar funded system where candidates only took up to $100, let's say. Would that be enough to get us to the place where we could trust that government was following the people as opposed to the funders? And Citizens United makes it hard to believe that that will ultimately be enough. So here's some numbers to put this in perspective. 2008, the total amount raised and spent for all campaigns for Congress was $1.4 billion. Less than 10% of that came from contributions under $200. In 
In 2009, lobbyists spent $3.5 billion lobbying Congress. Now, of course, people complain on both sides about lobbyists, and people on the right say, and there's all those labor lobbyists, and there were labor lobbyists. 1.2% of that money was lobbying <laughs> on behalf of labor. So $1.4 billion, $3.5 billion, here's the number to make one skeptical. If you took 1% of the corporate profits from the Fortune 400 in 2008, just 1%, this 1% you imagine devoted to political campaigns now, because the Supreme Court has said you can spend your money to promote or oppose anybody you want. 1% of the corporate profits from 2008 would be 6.2 billion dollars, totally swamping the amount that's been raised or spent in campaigns in 2008 or 2010. And indeed, when you see the rise in independent expenditures, even though the Supreme Court's decision was in some sense midway through the cycle for this recent election, there has been more than a 330% increase in independent expenditures in this last election alone, and you can be absolutely sure that in the next presidential election, this will skyrocket again. So those numbers, I think, are quite powerful to say, maybe this is not gonna be enough. But if this is not enough, if we need to go back to our Constitution and Article 5 and try to get an amendment to our Constitution, I still believe it's a mistake to try to rally a movement to get Congress to make this change. Because Congress is never going to change the system that gives them the protection and income security for the rest of time that this system gives them. And the only way to use our Constitution is to use the alternative path the framers gave us. Because the framers, in addition to saying Congress could propose an amendment, also said the states could get together and demand that Congress call a convention. A convention for the purpose of proposing amendments, which would then be considered and then possibly ratified as amendments to the Constitution. If 34 states demanded a convention of Congress, then Congress would have to call such a convention. And the convention could be called for any purpose. So some states could say, we want a line item veto power of the president. Other states could say, we want a balanced budget proposal. Other states could say, we want campaign finance reform. Doesn't matter the reason that motivated them. If they pass the resolution, 34 gets you a convention. And so long as you get 34, that's enough to guarantee that Congress would have to do something. And the proposed amendments that came out of a convention would then have to be ratified. And this is what scares people, because we don't have much faith in political bodies, because what we look at is Congress, and we think, oh my gosh, what crazies would come out of a political convention. But here's the thing to keep in mind. 38 states have to pass a proposed amendment if it's to become a constitutional amendment on it, uh, in addition to our Constitution, by legislatures or conventions, not referenda. And there are at least 12 solid red states and blue states in our republic that would block any crazy from either side. Indeed, just one house in 12 states could block an amendment from becoming part of our Constitution. Now, I believe this alternative path is the only feasible path and a better path for three reasons. Number one, it's free of Washington's control. Washington has no power to say no if 34 states call for a convention. Number two, it takes time. The process of getting state by state to ratify a call for a convention gives America a long time to listen to the arguments and to think about them. It's not a flash poll. It's not something that happens overnight. It would take four or five or six years to begin the project and to draw the attention this process needs. But the third point is, even if we lose the push for a convention, there is precedent to show we could win the call for reform. The last time Congress made a fundamental change in the architecture of their institution, 17th Amendment, which made the Senate elected rather than appointed, happened because the states were within one vote of calling for a convention, and that terrified Congress. The idea of an independent convention led them to act as quickly as they could to get the amendment out there that would stop the move for a convention. Now, I'm completely willing to say that maybe 
If we got citizen-funded elections, small-dollar-funded elections, we still would need some kind of amendment. And I'm willing to consider and to push this idea of an alternative path to an amendment because I think that's the only way to get there. But the question we should be focusing on, I think, right now is what should we do now? Because it turns out all of America is not like you. <laughs> all of America would not show up to a lecture on a Friday night given by a law professor <laughs> to talk about these issues. All of America doesn't believe or understand these issues are at the core of saving this republic. So there are things we need to do to bring America to the place that these changes are feasible. I want to say there are three. Here's number one. We need people to become root strikers. Recognize that we will get nothing of the things we care about, health care, global warming legislation, simpler tax programs, smaller government. We will get none of this until we get this kind of change. Nothing for the right or the left until we get this kind of change. So first, we need root strikers. And indeed, you can become a root striker by going to rootstriker.org. <laughs> Or if you text your email address to that telephone number, you will get a sign-up uh, petition. And rootstrikers.org is about pulling people into this movement to help others see this connection. Number two, once in this movement, you have to help us teach others. You have to help us get others to link. There, I've built a link there now. Um, these branches of evil and the root the root of money inside this system. And in all the ways in which you connect with people, you have to help them teach. And then on the internet, we help them teach by increasingly tagging every single story out there according to this meme. So if you're on Twitter, hashtagging root striker on every story that's about the way money is affecting results, then gets sucked into rootstrikers.org and begins to aggregate story after story that people on the left care about and people on the right care about. So we have an archive of material to help people understand the underlying corruption that is the system. And then joining entities like Common Cause or Public Campaign or Fix Congress First that are pushing to get this kind of reform in our government right now. And entertaining the idea of listening to people on the other side of the political spectrum who also believe that this issue is crucial to saving our democracy. So I'll point you to this one site, freetolead.com, which is a campaign site for a right-wing Republican, Buddy Romer, who is running for president. Romer is a Louisiana governor who for the last 20 years has run a community bank in Louisiana. He is running a campaign where he promises to take no more than $100 from anybody take no PAC money, disclose every single contribution, because he says what we need is a president who is free to lead. Now, I don't believe in the politics of Buddy Romer, but I believe in a political campaign where the person on the Republican ticket is a person who says money is corrupting our democracy so that the person on the Democratic ticket can remember that the thing he said when he got us to vote for him over Hillary Clinton is, unless we take up the fight to change this system, we will get no real reform ever. Until we get a Republican talking about this issue, no Democrat can pick up this issue. And so those of you who are Democrats, I think, need to begin to think about how do we get the right kind of Republican so that the issue we care about at the core can be part of this campaign. But number three, easiest but maybe most important, you should start wearing Keds. <laughs> I'm wearing Keds. Right here. Right. They're beautiful, but here's why you should wear Keds. Keds is made by Stride Right Shoes. Stride Right is founded by a man named Arnie Hyatt. Arnie's a very shy guy. This is the biggest picture I could find of him on the internet. <laughs> but Arnie is a loyal Democrat. And in 1996, he was the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. So in 1997, President Bill Clinton invited Arnie and 30 other contributors to a dinner at the Mayflower Hotel, a dinner for these fat cats, to tell the president exactly what they thought the president should do in the remaining four years of his administration, none of them recognizing that most of those years would be frittered away fighting a fight about 
a scandal with a 23-year-old intern. But each of the fat cats had a chance to stand up and tell the president what to do. And Arnie was the last to stand. We don't have a picture of this. I kind of envision it sort of like this. But <laughs> Arnie stands and he says this to the president. He says, Mr. President, I know you're an admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So I want you to put yourself in Roosevelt's shoes in 1939 when Roosevelt reluctantly recognized that he needed to, quote, convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. So Arnie said, you too, Mr. President, you have to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against fascists, a war against fat cats, against people like us, people who believe that merely because we are wealthy, we are entitled to direct government policy. People who believe that merely because we've been successful in the private marketplace, we have the right to pick up the phone and reach the president on the other line. People who have convinced America that democracy in America does not work. So you can imagine after Arnie said that in this room of 30 fat cats and the president, there was a little bit of silence. <laughs> The only published account we have of the evening reports that Clinton's response effectively slashed Hyatt to pieces, humiliating him in front of the group. Now, 15 years later, it's time that we recognize that Arnold Hyatt was right that evening. We do need to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. But where Arnie Hyatt was wrong was in his belief that politicians would be at the center of that war. <laughs> they won't be. It's citizens. It's us. It's root strikers. It's you. When Ben Franklin was carried out of the Constitutional Convention in his carriage, a woman stopped him on the street of Philadelphia and said, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? Franklin said, a republic, ma'am. If you can keep it, a republic, a representative democracy, a democracy dependent upon the people alone, we have lost that republic. We need to act to get it back. Thank you very much. His or her campaign. And the only way to change that this court is not going to change that, um, is to amend the Constitution. And I agree with you. The ideal democracy would be one where such power was not permitted in rich individuals. Um, but here's why I'm not as concerned about that as I'm concerned about the problem that I'm talking about here. Um, there are two reasons. Number one, the problem I'm concerned about is when a candidate is not responsive to the people because he's responsive to some other set of interests, right? It's a puppet for someone else, not dependent upon the people, dependent upon um, this funder. The self-funded candidate isn't a puppet. Might be a crazy, might be a fool, might be a genius, but he's not a puppet. So you might not like who he or she is, but you don't worry that he or she is serving some other master. And and so that's diff that makes it different. I'm not saying it makes it good. I'm just saying it makes it different. And the second reason is, it's hard for you in New York to believe this, but it turns out that self-funded candidates aren't terribly effective in getting elected. So California, if this were California, we'd have a lot of good evidence to say, you know, the fact that you're a billionaire doesn't mean you can buy a Senate seat or a governor's seat. Um, and so it's a problem. I agree it's a problem. But again, it feels to me if we rallied the troops to solve that problem, we still would not have solved the fundamental problem that, that confronts our democracy, which is not the rich people becoming candidates and running for office, um, but the rest of candidates who become dependent upon the rich people and therefore cannot hear 